Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a, another online Sunshine Salvo service, which I hope is coming through loudly and clearly. It's just good to be able to be with you this week. Uh, we had some significant issues last week in terms of the our ability to be able to do this service. And uh, that was certainly out of our control. We, um, it's, it's a tough time we're living in, I've got to say, you know, we're dealing with a global pandemic. We're dealing here in Victoria with uh, lockdowns, stage four restrictions. Our liberties are being impinged and, and, and our freedom um, curtailed. Even at night, we live under a curfew. Uh, there's all of these challenges going on that, of course, as far as our faith community goes, prevents us from being able to meet together and gathered for corporate worship. All of these challenges that have meant that we can only come together on a Sunday here in this uh, digital online forum. And then last Sunday, of course, even this way of gathering together was uh, completely messed up by the fact that uh, across um, Telstra's national NBN mainframe, they uh, came under a cyber attack and that uh, put down a lot of Telstra NBN um, home internet services, including ours. So. That was incredibly frustrating for us last week. We're trying to do our best to um, make the best way forward and still have a sense of gathering and being together. Uh, but sometimes technology and those things which are beyond our control just uh, also come in and complicate our lives as well. So I am happy to be here this morning. Our internet's working. Thank you, God, for that. And we can uh, resume the series that we've been looking at in terms of Nehemiah and his repairing of the gates and walls of Jerusalem, which we're going to do again this morning, looking at a couple of gates together because they're very similar in theme and, and close in proximity to each other, the fountain gate and the water gate. Let me pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land where we are gathered this morning, whether it be where I am or you are, we all gather upon sacred traditional lands of our First Nations people, the traditional owners. In my case, I sit here on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and those emerging leaders within our First Nations community. And of course, as a Salvation Army officer, representing the Salvation Army, I affirm the Salvation Army's commitment to reconciliation with our First Nations brothers and sisters. It is good to be with you today. Good morning to family out at Box Hill. Lovely to see you. Good morning, Diane. Great to see you here this morning. You have been in our thoughts and prayers as one of those um, workers in really some of the really um, stressful and perilous um, workplaces in our community at this time in aged care. And Diane, please be assured of our continued love, thoughts and prayers to you. Um, we really do hold you up and love you and really see the hero that you are in what you do with the really vulnerable uh, people in our community at this time, the seniors in our aged care. Um, God bless you, Diane. It's great to have you here this morning. Margaret Dyer and Marcia, good to see you. Good to see you, Norm and Lou. I hope you're feeling a little less stiff and sore this morning, Norm, after taking a bit of a tumble a couple of days ago but it's great to have you here this morning. Margaret Kelly out at Deer Park, good to see you. 
good morning to my auntie Ethel and Uncle Graham over in Box Hill. Lovely to have you with us this morning, Alison and Ian. Good to see you. To Sean, great to have you here, Sean. We look forward in a couple of weeks to having you share again with us here online in this space. Um, and it's good to have you here this morning. To our church family out in Melton, Joy and the Andrews, it's good to see you here this morning. Good morning to you, Ernst and Anne over in South Australia. Welcome to you this morning. And good morning to other family out at Muralbark this morning. Lovely to see you. To Joe, great to see you here this morning, Joe. Thank you for that update, Diane. Um, it's just uh, wanted everyone to know that um, our prayers are effective. Uh, all residents in her particular aged care facility are currently negative. So that's a wonderful, wonderful outcome. And we pray that that would continue. And also being mindful of uh, our own friends from within Sunshine Salvo's faith community who reside at James Barker House. Um, I know that last weekend, all residents, staff, anyone connected with James Barker House were tested for COVID. Uh, thus far, to the best of my knowledge, all of those results are also negative, which is wonderful. So we certainly think of you, Ian, particularly at this time and, and all our friends at James Barker House. And good morning also to Rob. Lovely to have you here this morning sharing for the first time in this online service there with Diane. You couldn't be in better company, my friend. So welcome to you this morning and others who will join us in due course over the duration of this coming hour as we share together here in this space. got a reading I want to bring to you this morning as an opening to our worship time. This reading is entitled, When the Seas Rage and the Mountains Fall. I think we all at this time have a real sense of there being a raging of the seas around us, that we are living in stormy times. So this is a lovely reading to commence this time of gathering together in worship. God is our refuge, our strength, ever ready to help in times of trouble. So we shall not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains fall into the depths of the sea, though its waters seethe and roar, and the mountains reel as they rage. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob, is our high stronghold. There is a river whose streams refresh the city of God and it sanctifies the dwelling of the Most High. God is in that city and she will not be overthrown. At the break of dawn, God helps her. Nations are in tumult, kingdoms hurled down. God thunders and the earth surges like a sea. And yet the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our high stronghold. Come, consider the works of the Lord, whose astounding deeds cover the earth, who brings wars to an end all over the world, breaks the bow, snaps the spear, burns the shield in a fire. Be still and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted over all the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our high stronghold. Amen. And I do pray that you have a sense of God being with you during these difficult and challenging times. He hasn't left us, not for one second. He continues to remain with us as we endure this season, but knowing 
that good things will follow and keeping our hope in that. Let me share a prayer with you as we commence worship this morning. Father, we thank you that you are still with us, that you are our stronghold, that you are the anchor of our soul. We thank you, Lord, because in these troubled times when things feel so out of control, you are the one who brings stillness and order and calm and peace into our lives, holding us up. Lord, we thank you that you are our confident, ever present and assuring God that you are with us, that you're our fortress and our rock. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, this morning I want to pray particularly for a person down in Geelong. I want to pray, Lord, for Joe's sister, Geraldine, who has been really enduring some very poor health in recent days, uh, was in intensive care recently, and and we thank you, Lord, that you've been with her and that she is now ready to be discharged back home. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for Geraldine that you would continue to be her healing God, that you would continue to be with her, that you would restore her in her recovery back to fullness of health. Lord, be with her. Be with Jo as well as she worries so, so dearly for her sister with some distance in between them. Lord, be with Jo also at this time. Continue to touch her and surround her with your love and your healing. Bring stillness and wellness to Joe at this time also. We continue to think of all of the seniors who are a part of our faith community here at Sunshine Salvos. Lord, we ask that your hedge of protection would be around each of them. Lord, bless them and keep them safe. Ensure, Lord, that they have the necessary supports in and around their lives to continue to look after their daily needs. Lord, bless them. And we continue to think of those other friends and those we don't know in aged care centres around this country, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would also be with them and their families and be with the staff who are entrusted with the very um, unenviable task of looking after those, those seniors in aged care places. Lord, be with those staff as well protecting them, giving them a sense of diligence about their job, but also, Lord, keeping them safe as well. We pray for our leaders at this time, the leaders in our local governments, the leaders in our state government, and also our federal leaders. Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide them in wisdom, that you would continue to make their paths straight, that you would continue to give them a sense of discernment and clarity in the decisions that they have to make for this community at this time. Lord, bless each and every one of those leaders at this time. And for us, Lord, as we consider this morning what the fountain gate and the water gate mean, Lord, we ask that you would wash us clean, that you would bless us as we gather together in this place of worship here online. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm in. I'm going to sing a couple of songs this morning. I uh, asked my uh, youngest son, who I'd also ask you to uphold in prayer. Um, Luke uh, is doing year 12 and, and with um, the stage four restrictions that have just come into place, um, has again been consigned to doing remote learning at home. Uh, that wasn't easy for him earlier this year when that was the case and now he finds himself in that position again. Um, so uphold him in your thoughts and prayers as well. But I asked him this morning if he'd join us uh, for worship and, and he asked me, well, what songs are we singing? Uh, he didn't know the first one that I'm about to do. So he, he said, when I when I come up with some songs that are 
basically songs of living memory, then he might consider coming back to join us. So we hope that that won't be too far away. But I did want to do this song this morning, which is an old song from the Salvation Army songbook. It may also have been sung around uh, other churches as well. It's a song that fits in beautifully with uh, the theme of our worship and uh, the message this morning about water. So I'll be singing first, Down Where the Living Waters Flow. You may know it. There's a good chance perhaps some of you won't know it. But have a listen. It's a catchy little tune and you'll be able to follow along with it. And then I'll be singing uh, Come to the Table, just a wonderful modern song um, that speaks of the open inclusivity of the table where Jesus sits, where we're all invited and can freely sit and share with him. Once I was far in sin, but Jesus took me in down where the living waters flow. To us there he gave me sight and let me see the light down where the living waters flow. Down where the living waters flow. Down where the tree of life does grow. I'm living for the light, for Jesus now I'll fight, down where the living waters flow. With Jesus at my side, I need no other guide, down where the living waters flow. He is my hope and stay, He saves me every day. Down where the living waters flow, down where the living waters flow, down where the tree of life does grow, I'm living in the light, for Jesus now I'll fight, down where the living waters flow, down where the living waters flow. Down where the tree of life does grow, I'm living in the light, for Jesus now I'll fight, down where the living waters flow, down where the living waters flow. start on the outside, the outside looking in, this is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give, all the shape that we were in. But just when all hope seems lost, Love opened the door for us. He said, Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these thieves. No one's unwelcome here. So that sin and shame you brought with you 
you can leave it at the door and let mercy draw you near. Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table. To the thief and to the doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the old, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the thirst, all the paupers and the princes, all who failed you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who lost and loved another, all the chain and all the free, all who follow, all who lead, everyone who's been let down. All the lost you have been found, all who be labeled right or wrong, and everyone who hears this song, come to the table, come join the sinners, you have been redeemed, take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Sit down and be set free. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Father, we thank you that your table is always open that you're always there with your arms wide open waiting for us to join you. No exclusions, no exceptions, unconditional love that only flows from that table. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the grace, all the wonder, all the beauty of who you are. And we worship you this morning on this new day. Lord, we give ourselves to you again afresh and new to you this day. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Good morning to you, Arne and Michelle. Thank you again, Arne, for supplying words for us this morning to assist us in our worship this morning. Really appreciate that. Some announcements for this morning uh, really include um, simply the fact that for those who are a part of our Thursday night small group, that will be taking place again this Thursday evening at 7 p.m. I'll be sending out the um, Facebook room invites for everyone who has nominated themselves to be a part of that group. And uh, we will be looking this week at uh, continuing the road trip with Jesus. We've been to Nazareth and Capernaum and, and, and this Thursday we'll be taking a little boat ride right out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee as the next stop on our journey, our road trip with Jesus. So that'll be Thursday night, seven o'clock for those who are a part of that group. I've been really uh, blessed to have been able to catch up with some of our, particularly our seniors in, in the last week or so. And, and I wanted to let you know just about um, some news around a couple of, of those seniors. Um, I had a lovely phone call with Janet, Janet Hillhouse, who uh, is loved by many of us. And uh, uh, Janet 
lives with her family. Um, they've recently moved. They had been living in um, Maidstone, just not far from High Point Shopping Centre, uh, but they've recently moved to Port Melbourne, uh, not far from Station Pier. And I, know, I believe they're in one of those apartments down there. Uh, she continues to live with her daughter and, and son-in-law. Um, what that means for Janet, of course, I mean, at this time, regardless of where we are, as we all know, we're fairly much isolated. Um, but of course, even when things do resume to some sense of normality, it, it will be unlikely that uh, Janet will be able to share with us regularly at Sunshine Salvos as she has done. Uh, and that's a shame, but we know that Janet is being well looked after and uh, and we'll certainly see Janet from time to time, just probably a little less of her. But she's well and she gave us a wonderful update of uh, the fact that she is doing okay and she loves her new environment um, and is being looked after well at this time. So that's a little update about Janet and also received in the mail a lovely little letter, which I have here from Faye out in Airport West. This letter, people still do write letters, which is really lovely to get. Write a letter to someone this week, surprise them. Hopefully they might get it maybe in the next, um, before the end of the year, because I believe that Australia Post are quite inundated at the moment with their mail, but it's good to write letters. But Faye has written here that uh, she is doing well. She's very fortunate to um, have her shopping done every fortnight, her place cleaned and, and her daughter Jenny is looking after her. She shares um, an evening every night uh, with her daughter and, and the grandkids on Facebook, on FaceTime, uh, which is great. And also hears frequently from her friends at Sunshine Salvos um, and her sister as well. So Faye is doing well and uh, we're thankful for that. I know that um, in recent days I've caught up with Margaret Dyer and Marcia there in Braybrook and that they're doing okay. Um, we we'll continue to pray for you, Margaret, in your health at this time. Uh, and and we do our best to try and keep in touch, particularly with um, many of the seniors who are just a, a lovely part of our church family, our faith community at Sunshine Salvos. And we will continue in the days ahead to uh, try and make sure that we're not strangers to any of you, but particularly to those of you who would consider yourself seniors. And I know that uh, those close to us our, our our parents out at Box Hill are also doing quite well and, and would pass their regards on to everyone as well. They're being well looked after. That's all the announcements I have for this morning. Uh, appreciating that uh, we are living in um, stage four restrictions where even more locked down than ever. And that that uh, continues to mean that for us at Sunshine Salvos, we have limited our um, on-site presence at Devonshire Road to, to just two days a week, Thursday and Friday. Um, but on Fridays, of course, we, we continue our, our community meal program as a takeaway meal. Uh, even in these stage four restricted times, just, uh, this past Friday, two days ago, we we had no trouble at all giving out 100 meals to people who came in, um, still in great numbers from the community. And particularly a lot of in, young international students we're finding coming in and availing themselves of, of services at this time, appreciating that they don't have the financial uh, supports and backing of, of, of the government's Centrelink or welfare system, so that uh, we are seeing a, an increasing number of young international students who, who really do need a bit of extra help at this time. So our food 
emergency food provision work continues. Fung and I have our work permits and we're free to go around and deliver hampers, which we continue to do. Um, but even in this time, restricted to just Thursdays and Fridays that we're down at the hall. But of course, uh, trying to keep in touch and, and, and we'll keep um, worshipping as a faith community and leading you in this digital space into the days ahead. People have asked, well, when do these uh, restrictions end? Um, well, the best of my knowledge is that the stage four restrictions end sometime in September. That will take us back to stage three restrictions again. When they end, I don't know. And honestly, I, I can't even tell you when we may be able to gather again back in corporate worship. Um, if that is before Christmas, then I'll be most thankful to God for that. But really, um, the way ahead is unclear. In fact, I know a song that just came into my mind that I might just sing that just sort of reflects that thought of not knowing the way ahead necessarily, but still being able to be hopeful and knowing and trusting that we're in God's hands. This is very impromptu. I'm in his hands. I'm in his hands. Whatever the future holds, I'm in his hands. The way I cannot see have all been planned for me. His way is best, you see. I'm in his hands, I'm in his hands, I'm in his hands, whatever the future holds, I'm in his hands, the way I cannot see has all been planned for me, his way is best you see. I'm in his hands. We are in his hands and we may not be able to see the way ahead, but Jesus still holds us in his hands and he knows the way ahead and will make the path straight for us. May that continue to be your hope and your prayer this morning. Alison's just provided an update here on, that's quite concerning and, and really is a, a prayer request for us all to consider in the days ahead. Alison just this week had been informed that um, she and, and other prison chaplains uh, are unable currently to enter back into the prisons to provide their necessary support at this time. So please pray for all the women and men at this time as well uh, in prisons um, and also the chaplains um, who, who would love to be in there doing their job and providing support, but at this time can't. We will continue to hold you up in prayer, Alison, in the days ahead. Good morning to you. Vicky, lovely to see you. And good morning to you, Kevin and Hillary out there in Melton. Lovely to have you with us this morning. This morning, we turn our attention to two gates. And it was always my plan to do these two gates together um, because they are quite similar in theme and in close proximity to each other. So I'll be reading some selected verses from Nehemiah 3 this morning that take us to Nehemiah's repair of the fountain gate and the water gate. I'll just find my spot here. From Nehemiah chapter 3, Selected verses from 15 onwards. Shalom, son of Kolhozer, 
the leader of the Mizpah district repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it, roofed it, hung its doors and installed its bolts and bars. Then he repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam near the king's garden. And he rebuilt the wall as far as the stairs that descend from the city of David. Next to him was Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, the leader of half the district of Beth Zur. He rebuilt the wall to the place opposite the royal cemetery and as far as the water reservoir and the house of the warriors. And moving on to verse 25, Palal, the son of Uzai, carried on the work from the point opposite the buttress and the corner to the upper tower that projects from the king's house besides the court of the guard. Next to him were Pedaiah, the son of Porosh, and the temple servants living on the hill of Othel, who repaired the wall as far as the water gate toward the east and the projecting tower. Then came the people of Tekoa, who repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower and over to the wall of Othel. May God add wisdom to the reading of his word this morning. It's opportune this morning, of course, to remind you, remind you all that um, the, these repair, repairing and, and, and fixing of the gates and walls of Jerusalem just um, didn't happen um, because someone came up one day, one day with the idea that it should be done. Um, it was very intentional. It wasn't just a, a snap decision to do it even it wasn't a decision that was based on aesthetics or, or anything like that. It was a decision made by Nehemiah, who had a very specific intent and reason as to why he thought it was important that there be a solid um, rebuilding of the broken walls of Jerusalem and a repairing of those broken down gates. And that reasoning, which I, I spoke about very early in this series on Nehemiah and the gates and walls of Jerusalem, his reasoning was quite clear in his mind. Nehemiah was someone who was obsessed, along with a lot of other, um, especially priestly um, class within uh, Judah at that time, having just returned from exile in Babylon and Persia, Nehemiah and his friends were obsessed with Jerusalem being as tight as a drum in terms of not being open to allowing others to come in and spoil the holy city, the city of David, Jerusalem. There was a renewed sense and a fervor that really drove Nehemiah to creating a watertight uh, boundary around Jerusalem that would protect it against outside influences, uh, contaminants, if you like, influences or things that could come in and infect that um, renewed community of faith in Jerusalem, having so many just returning from exile, they were seeking to build again, rebuild, to start again, in effect. And in their view, what had happened to Jerusalem and what had happened to the community of faith in and around Jerusalem and Judah was that um, while they were away, that, that things had gotten out of hand, that, that local Jews had mixed with other um, people from other nations, uh, that there had been um, far less attention given to the, the devotion to the temple and worship. And, and so Nehemiah was resolute in coming back 
to Jerusalem to fix these gates and walls because he wanted to keep outside influences out and to restore Jerusalem back to a very sanitized, clean city of God. That was his passion. That was what drove him. That was his motivation. Now, if there's ever a time that we could begin to have some understanding of what that particular view is, particularly within Judaism, of being clean, and being super aware of things that are unclean that could contaminate us um, so that we are constantly in a process of sanitizing ourselves. If, if we who are not Jewish could understand that as easily as any time, it would be now. Because aren't we all in that very process in our daily life, washing our hands as we've been told to, sanitizing with hand sanitizer? wearing our masks, keeping out those contaminants that could be breathed upon us. That's a huge part of our psyche at this time. We are super aware of the things that are threatening to our health, namely COVID-19, uh, that we simply don't want to have come near us. We don't want to touch it. We don't want to catch it. We don't want it breathed on us. We are very aware that we need to keep ourselves isolated and safe and shut away from any of those outside influences of COVID-19 that could affect us. If we can connect with this Jewish idea at any time, as I said, it would be now. In a way, we're all a little bit like Nehemiah, building our own gates and walls again around our homes, around ourselves, trying to keep ourselves safe from things that could harm us from the outside. I think we get this. We understand this now better than ever. And so that was Nehemiah, where Nehemiah was coming from. That was his passion. It's good to be reminded of that again, especially when we come to this gate or these gates today in considering the water gate and the fountain gate, which were as we have been reflecting on the gates and walls as a rectangular clock, we find the fountain gate roughly at about seven o'clock on that clock in the southeast corner, and then the water gate just a little bit above that. And they were located particularly within Jerusalem around an area that was um, obviously had some water source attached to it. So that we had mentioned even in the, in the scripture that I read, that just near the fountain gate, for example, was the pool of Siloam. That's a, a, a pool that may ring a bell with you and be familiar to you. It's a pool where Jesus um, sent a man who he had healed to go and wash his eyes in the pool of Siloam. Um, there's also a reservoir that was mentioned around that area. Just outside the water gate that led down into the Kidron Valley. But before you would get there, you would come to what was called the Gihon Spring, that was a natural water source uh, which supplied a fair proportion of water to Jerusalem. So in that particular corner, if you like, of Jerusalem's walls we have this concentration of water. That's why you have a fountain gate and a water gate because people went out through the water gate and fountain gate particularly to access water. And water was important to Jerusalem as it is to any city, we need our water of course. But it was extra important and certainly important to Nehemiah that the fountain gate and water gate were repaired and repaired well because they were the exit points for people to get water, but also the entry points for them to come back in with water, water for drinking, but importantly, water also for cleansing and cleaning, which was such a vital and um, fundamental part of Jewish thinking at that time, and, and still is among um, some tr very traditional uh, Jewish communities. 
uh, I've heard stories of um, workplaces that, that, for example, may have um, employees that are of the Jewish faith, um, and if they're very traditional and strict in their Judaism, then they will ensure that their coffee cup or their or their cutlery and crockery that they may use to, at, during lunchtime or at their workplace will be kept very separate from everyone else's and that they only themselves would ever wash their own coffee cup or bowl or whatever that may be because they are so um, concerned with the idea of things being contaminated. Uh, I can remember clearly even um, just two or three years ago, Fung and I one day went to Balaclava, which is right in the heart of the Jewish community in the southeast of Melbourne. And uh, we, we went to a, a Jewish store. We were uh, picking up some goods, I think, for, for conducting our um, Passover cedar meal that we, we normally would do on a Thursday evening before Easter. And uh, we went into the store and, and that was fine and we got our things and there wasn't any problem with that. But as we were about to leave, um, there was uh, two or three black robed Hasidic um, Jews, strict traditional Jews, who um, we could see were, were, were mortified um, because they potentially nearly came into close contact with us. I don't think my contact with them would have been so much a concern, but certainly when they saw Fung and recognising that uh, there aren't many Vietnamese Jews getting around the community um, and that she was a female, they were absolutely terrified and, and, and quickly ducked around to another aisle to get away from us. Such was their uh, paranoia and, and feeling that we don't and can't afford to be contaminated by these non-Jews. And, and, and it's really um, in some ways disturbing, I have to say, when, when you actually have a, a living example of that happen to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So for those in Jerusalem, the water gate and fountain gate was incredibly important. It was the place where often they would, would not only bring water in for their own um, nourishment and sustainment, but also for their ritual cleansing and keeping clean and making sure that they were clean um, of anything that could be a contaminant at all. And of course, remembering that those gates aren't so far as uh, from the Dung Gate, which we looked at recently, which was obviously a rubbish gate and an entry point to the, the tip of Jerusalem, if you like. And so ritual cleaning was very important around that particular corner of Jerusalem and its walls and gates. So what do we make of this fountain gate, this water gate for us in our life, in our circumstances? I think that whilst at this time we all would agree that we do need to be necessarily vigilant in how we look after ourselves, in how we <clears throat> in how we keep ourselves safe. That's such a huge mindset for us all at the moment. And it's the right thing to be keeping isolated from others, keeping apart keeps us together. We, we hear this all the time now. It's a part of our life, our thinking now. And so we all are very tuned into that message in a good way, in a positive way. We need to look after ourselves physically. We need to ensure in every way possible that we curtail the spread of this insidious virus that is just wreaking so much havoc upon our community, our state here in Victoria, but even more so across the world in, in the devastating numbers and effects that it's having in other countries. Um, it's just a, a pandemic of such awful proportions that none of us could have ever envisaged that we would live through. So we need to be super vigilant in playing our part and doing our part in keeping ourselves safe, but also 
keeping those around us in the community safe. We get that, we understand that. We need to be vigilant in our sanitizing, our, the way that we keep ourselves clean. So if we had, in a sense, a fountain gate and a water gate, uh, then we would really want to fill those, the, particularly, I guess, the fountain gate with um, antiseptic and just bathe ourselves in it all the time to keep ourselves clean and, and sterile and, 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 um, and out of harm's way from a virus that threatens us. But in terms of a spiritual meaning to these gates, what might those things mean for us? Because I don't believe for one minute that Sunshine Salvos is in any way committed to keeping people out. Not in any way, not in any sense. We are on the flip side of that, absolutely committed to opening our gates and our entrance points to anyone and everyone. We're an inclusive community. We're not an exclusive community. We don't align ourselves with the motivation even of a Nehemiah in believing that there are other people out there who we want to keep out. Alternatively, we want to ensure that we provide every opportunity for any person and particularly those who've been shut out of places in the community. We want to open up our doors and our gates for those people to enjoy community. That's Jesus' message. That was his life. That was his example. And that's what we're committed to. So the water gate for us and the fountain gate, yes, they are gates for cleansing, but they are not gates of exclusion. They really need to be opened up and seen to be gates of inclusion for us. The other wonderful thing about those gates and about water is that it reminds me very much of the story from John chapter four, where Jesus came to talk with the woman at the well. And if I read some of this just for a moment, you'll be reminded of this story, but there's a real connection point with these words from Jesus from John chapter four. He says to this Samaritan woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink of water, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did all his sons and the flocks and the herds. And Jesus answered this woman, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, the water from that well. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in that person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It's a little bit like the water that comes in a fountain that springs up and bubbles up. And Jesus gives this wonderful example of how the kind of water that Jesus deals with isn't the kind of water that comes out of an earthly fountain or a spring or a reservoir, but it's living water. It's deeper. It's nourishing, not just beyond the immediate, but to the eternal. It's a water that's deeper than simple earthly H2O. It is something about this living water that Jesus gives that is just wonderfully and spiritually nourishing and sustaining. And so we are again, as we pass through these two gates, the fountain gate and the water gate, drawn back to the wellspring of life, Jesus, the living water, water that doesn't shut people out, Water that, does, water that doesn't exclude people, water that invites people in, water that nourishes all, water that is eternal. Later on in the New Testament, Paul also spoke of water. And he said this 
He said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, he speaks of the way that Jesus Christ loves the church. We are the church. So it's also speaking to us individually. That Jesus loves us so much and he cleanses us by the washing with water through his word. So that this living water, this water that Jesus washes us with on a daily basis is actually a cleansing and a washing with spiritual water that happens through the spirit. It happens within us. Now, we, I, I hope and presume most of us jump in a shower every day. We understand on a daily basis that water flows over us for the purpose of cleansing and washing our bodies. In the same way, Jesus washes us through his spirit on a daily basis, cleansing us through the water and washing and cleansing through his word. What does that mean for us? It means that the fountain gate and the water gate are places where living water is available to us. That living water comes to us through the spirit that is within us, nourishing us, moving us forward into becoming into the likeness of Jesus, but also refreshes us and teaches us and sustains us, nourishes us through the word of God. I would encourage you in these days of isolation to fall in love again, even more so with the word of God, to consult it daily, to read it deeply, to draw upon the water of life that comes through the word of God. There is no greater water gate or fountain gate that we could pass through every day than to open this book and to consult the very words that truly for our souls are living water. So in these days when we are and continue to be so conscious of cleanliness, may we also be very aware that the fountain gate and the water gate for us are not the old gates that shut people out. They're not the gates of law. They're not the gates of exclusion. They are the water gates of grace and love and inclusion that are available to all, but are certainly available to us on a daily basis as we continue to come back to Jesus so that he can continue that lovely holiness process of rinsing us and cleansing us from the inside out, cleaning us and shaping us more into his likeness. And the place where that happens is when we engage with God through his word. So fall in love with your Bible. Get it out a bit more, dust the cover off. Um, open up the pages, get reading. God's word again. That is where your water gate and your fountain gate lie. In those words, in those pages, in the truth of God's word. So as we move through and beyond the water gate and the fountain gate, we move towards next week two more gates that we will focus on. The horse gate and the east gate. And we'll see how they speak to us in the furtherance and continuance of our journey with Nehemiah at this time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of living water. We thank you for the fountain gate and the water gate that we come to every day, or at least should come to, the place of your word, the place where we're nourished, the place where we're fed, and kept alive because your word is alive with living water. Lord, we thank you for your spirit, which is within us and prompts us back into your word, back deeper and closer into you. Lord, continue to refresh our hearts with your living water in these days of um, real concern in our community. Lord, sustain us in these challenging times lord we feel parched and we feel dry but lord we know that your word 
and your spirit are an oasis that we can come to. Lord, remind us on a daily basis that you are the source of living water, that we may draw deep from you to be nourished for the days ahead. Lord, we thank you for your living water. Bless us in the days ahead as we continue to live simply one day at a time, but doing so with you by our side. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are to us. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. I have a benediction that I'm going to leave with you this morning. I think at this time, more than any time, we need peace. Peace to calm and still our troubled hearts for the circumstances that we're living through. So this benediction really is a, a blessing that focuses on deep peace. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air. Deep peace of the quiet earth. Deep peace of the shining stars. Deep peace of the gentle night. Moon and stars pour their healing light on you. Deep peace of Christ, the light of the world to you the deep peace of the Christ of God to you all today and in the days ahead. Amen. God bless you. I'm glad that this service happened today and I pray that you have been better for having shared this past hour together with each other as a community of faith here in this space. God bless you in the days ahead. We'll be back here. For those who are a part of the Thursday night group on Thursday night at seven, but certainly next Sunday we'll be back again to have a look, as I said, at the horse gate and the east gate in really coming towards the end of our journey around the gates and walls with Nehemiah. But God bless you this week. May deep peace be with you. Bye for now.